Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight for tonight's Cooperation Live. My name is Izzy Uzarali. I'm the Co-op Party's Events Officer, and I'm really pleased to be chairing tonight's uh, event. Uh, we're going to examine the steps being taken to grow the number of cooperative businesses across the UK. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from our speakers and you as well um, on that later on. Um, before we start, um, if for anyone who's not been on any of these Zoom sessions before, a couple of Zoom housekeeping rules that we'd like to, um, to, to, to keep to. Um, so firstly, uh, this event is uh, being recorded. Uh, we make it available on the Co-op Party's YouTube channel uh, for those who can't be with us live tonight. Uh, so if you don't want to um, share your image, please go to, um, please stop your video and go to sound only. Um, if you've got difficulty hearing, um, I can enable closed captioning by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And you have been muted. Um, that's to make the content of the call clearer um, and stop any interruptions of background noise. Probably hear my dog barking then. Um, so only those speaking uh, will have sound enabled. And when it's your turn to speak, we'll send you an ask to unmute message. After we've heard from today's speakers, we're going to go hold a, a question and answer um, session uh, if we have time. Um, and you can ask a question in one of two ways. You can either raise your virtual hand or you can post questions in the chat. And um, finally, just before we start, um, I just wanted to emphasize that the cult party believes our cult values should be reflected in our actions as well as our policies. And we want all our members to feel uh, safe welcome and respected in our party. So please ensure you abide by this when you make your contributions tonight and I really look forward to hearing from them. And now onto tonight's event. Um, as you know, one of the key priorities of the co party is to drive the growth of cooperative businesses across the UK. And I'm really delighted I can share with you the work of three speakers who are key to delivering this at the moment um, and uh, delivering this and our commitment to doubling the size of the cooperative economy um, under a future uh, Labour and Co-op government. Um, tonight you'll be hearing from my boss and our General Secretary, Joe Fortune, from Rose Marley, who's uh, Chief Executive of our umbrella organisation, Co-ops UK, and Glenn Barron, who is Interim Chief Executive at Quampus, who you may know as the Wales Co-op Centre. Um, they're all working to achieve this and um, we'll have time for questions to them afterwards. So on that note, I'd like to pass over to Joe. Thank you, Izzy. Hello, everyone. Nice to say hello. Nice to say hello. Nice to see you this evening. And thanks for making some time for being with us. Really appreciate it. Um, as Izzy says, court growth, ambition for our movement is central to what we do in the party. It's central to many aspects of, uh, of the movement at, at large. And we know why. We know why we want to move, uh, to, to grow and to, in, and to enlarge, because of all the benefits that we know that cooperatives uh, provide community and the economy. The, the benefits are obvious. Uh, we know them, not just through our values and principles, but through the practical application of cooperatives on the ground. We know they're more resilient, more productive. We know that they they invest more in community. They provide fairer work opportunities. And the list goes on. Like, the benefit is what really well known. Um, everyone will accept it. We'll all, of course, we'll all accept it on this call. However, what I'm concerned about is that if we know that to be the case, that we're not growing where we should be. We, we're not growing quick enough because we need to provide much more value to, to this country, especially, especially through the times in which we live. We know that we can uh, be part and parcel of a significant change in the country, and therefore we must be ambitious for our movement. That's where we start from. And then we have a look at what the conditions for that growth looks like uh, currently. And I've got to say, from my point of view, I don't believe that there, there are adequate conditions for rapid growth in the cooperative movement uh, as, as we sit here today. And it's, a, it's a, a, a great shame that that is the case. But my reading of why it isn't is because we've got a government, uh, not just this particular government, but governments uh, who aren't focused on corpse of growth and aren't supporting corpse of growth in the way in which they support other types of uh, business endeavour. Um, one of the things which I find uh, concerning, uh, especially in a Westminster setting, is you, you can work very hard and not really identify a single pound spent in Westminster for corpse of growth, for corpse of growth uh, in the way in which we talk. It may feature in other plans, it may sort of touch on other aspects, but corpse of growth itself. Uh, not barely a pound. 
And I, I just think that that's crazy, given the amount of pounds spent on other aspects of business support, business advice, business um, uh, enlargement, startups and all the rest. We, we, we're not there and we should be. Um, and not only that, I don't believe that we have a regulatory and legislative framework which encourages cooperative growth sometimes. Uh, we talk about level playing fields and we might even talk about it tonight. But actually, I think it's uh, from my point of view, I want much, much more than a level playing field. I'm not interested in a level playing field. I want more, much more pro cooperative legislation, pro cooperative regulation, not just in a position where we're not forgotten. Uh, I've, I've sat in this, these seats for long enough um, to know that, that that conversation happens. Don't forget about the co-ops. Well, no, we want much more than that. We don't just want to have uh, legislation and regulation without unintended consequence for ourselves. We want legislation and regulation, which actually stimulates cooperative growth. So I want us to have uh, a government uh, in Westminster in this setting. It could be governments and local authorities uh, right around the country. But in this conversation, as Izzy says, looking towards uh, potentially a general election and potentially a change of government, what do we want from it? So I want finance uh, financial support uh, for court growth and i want legislation and regulation uh, to facilitate that it's noticeable that in our country we have uh, 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 unlike many other european countries uh, basic legislation uh, no basic legislation which says the government should support co-ops ilo recommendation 193 um, it's a it's an obvious piece uh, on a really basic level there's a duty on government to support co-ops in many other countries, and we just don't have one. Uh, you know, on a really basic level, I would, I'd like to see that change. So the regulation, the, the legislation, the finance for cooperative development, because uh, when we look around and, and it's something that we've touched on and there's great work, and we're going to hear from great work from uh, Quampus and, and, and Co-ops UK, uh, and there are others as well, uh, but there aren't enough other aspects of uh, cooperative development in this country. That's clear to myself after sitting here for, for, for long enough. We haven't got enough opportunity uh, for people to understand how to set uh, co-ops up, have the, the right support. Professional service support doesn't exist. So we want we want more of that. Not We want to celebrate what we have. Of course we do. We, we, want, to, we want to encourage and grow what we have, but we want more as well. Um, so from my point, from the party's point of view, from my point of view, I think that's central. I also think things in terms of education and awareness are central as well. I think that it's very hard for uh, it, people to say, oh, well, where's your demand? Well, they don't know about it. You know, they, 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 they don't come across them. And they, don't, and they don't have then people to go and talk to, even if they do. So we, we need to break that cycle. We need to we need to bust or open that cycle. We need we need specific things, capital raising uh, instruments. We need those. Uh, it's, it, there's fantastic ones which exist, fantastic ones which exist uh, around the world, uh, but not not for us. Um, you know, nationwide have sort of got one, uh, but others don't really have any sort of facility. So I want to see that changed as well. So I think that, that and from my point of view, I suppose. I think that the way the co-op sector and co-op movement grows is well understood amongst us. Um, I think that we sort of know what the answers are and what we now need to be is confident in, really confident in articulating that need and that want, really bold about our ambition. And that's where double the size comes from for us. So double the size for the, from the co-op party's point of view is all about articulating ambition, articulating want for growth. It, it, and we've put that into Labour Party manifestos in 2017, 2019. And I see it as one of my key goals at the minute is to try and land it in the future Labour Party uh, manifesto as well. Um, and I'm uh, myself and the party are working really hard towards that uh, towards that end. We've seen it supported by many uh, shadow cabinet, uh, senior shadow cabinet figures. We've seen it supported by Metro mayors. We've seen it supported by councillors, activists, the whole party. Um, now, I want to see it into, into a new manifesto as well. And why double uh, is some, sometimes is a question sort of asked of me. And it is that basic ambition piece, but it's also double the benefit that we're already given. So if we have uh, 14 and a half thousand co-ops or 15,000 co-ops rather than seven and a half thousand, you're twice as likely to see one. You're twice as likely to be involved in one. You're twice as likely to be affected by one. That, that in itself will have a stimulating uh, piece in the economy. For me as well, 
I want also to be, when we talk about the change that we want to see in the economy, of course, it will be other types of organisation, it might be social enterprise, it may be other aspects of uh, what I believe to be better forms of business model, but I want us to be the front of it, I want us to be at the vanguard, co-ops to be at the vanguard of it, we're the co-op party for good reason. Um, so I want us to be able, through our own growth and ambition, to create an environment in which other types of better business also uh, flourish, also feel that they have a role. So that's where I'm, uh, I'm coming from, the party's coming from, from our ambition. That's some of the aspects I believe uh, are important, but I know that there's other aspects of, uh, of growth which are important to discuss as well. Uh, but as I say, look, I could, to be honest, I could probably do the hour and Izzy will definitely mute me uh, if I if I go anywhere close. Uh, so there's some introductory remarks about why I believe growth uh, to be important, how we might grow and indeed uh, in, our, in our terms, what we're looking for from uh, Double Size and our sister party and others. So hopefully that helps, Izzy. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. That was really great. And, um, and, and just to reiterate, if people have got questions for you about how we want to achieve that ambition, uh, we'll, we'll go for we'll go for questions afterwards um, and now I'm going to pass on to Rose. Um, Rose is Chief Executive of Co-ops UK and I believe she's got uh, she's going to share up um, so welcome to our uh, Co-op Live tonight Rose and I believe you've got a PowerPoint to share as well so um, I would look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to see so many familiar faces and names and some new ones as well. Yes, I have put together a little bit of a um, slide show for you. Um, and that's predominantly because I am going to share some uh, statistics with you. So if you just give me a second to go into uh, presentation mode, um, I'm going to kind of whiz through these um, slides. Uh, because I'm not sure uh, who uh, I've got and what you know, so there's some of this you'll know all about and, and some will be brand new information to you, but it should give you some ideas uh, for questions and for our discussion going forward. So in terms of uh, Cooperatives UK, yeah, we're the, uh, as, as, as uh, Izzy said, we're the sort of umbrella um, trade body, if you like, for the movement, and we represent the 7,000 cooperatives in the UK, which represents, you know, uh, an income for the UK of, it's actually 40.1 billion now, um, and nearly 14 million uh, memberships within those cooperatives. Um, but that's just 1% of the UK economy. Uh, like Joe said, you know, we've got a lot of work to do here. Um, and there's this really strong evidence, which we'll go on to talk about, about why co-ops are great for the economy, but not at least some of the research that we've done is that um, it was actually four times in the pandemic 2020, and that increased to five times in 2021 in terms of resilience compared to other forms of, of business. And there's something in that about member ownership and that kind of long-term commitment and investment and, and not being uh, venture capital led, for example, and looking for exit routes. But, you know, that membership, that ownership, that togetherness is really important and it really makes a considerable impact on both the um, economy and socially as well. You know, co-ops are also proven vehicles for collective action and not least through the co-op party themselves. Um, co-ops are across all sectors you know we, we we all know about the co-op at the end of our street the supermarket and you can see they're the they're the biggest kind of income generator at 28.4 billion really strong in, in in other areas like housing but there's some really exciting innovation as well and i strongly believe that the future of cooperation does lie in digital and uh, tech which is something we'll go on to talk about but in terms of those benefits of cooperatives you know we've got the resilience we've got all sorts of really well documented um, understanding of what co-ops bring to for example workers and members around mental health and well-being uh, something that's really important and really popular now is this idea of non-extractive wealth. Um, but this is the idea that, you know, that the co-op pound, you know, the majority of the co-op pound stays in its in the UK and stays predominantly in its locality, whether that's through local jobs, whether that's through uh, supply chains, for example. And so having co-ops in your community and in your economy is good for your local economy, but it's good for the, the UK as well. And what we also get with cooperatives is, is good products and services, actually, because, you know, all those drivers in the values and principles. And um, I've worked in a lot of uh, different types of business. I came out of 
entertainment and real kind of, you know, capitalist structures uh, in, in, in massive global organisations like um, in the music industry. And then I've worked, I've, I founded a, a kick, a CIC. And something that's different about being member-led and cooperative-led is those board meetings are really different. The drivers for change when you're having a discussion are really different and that creates good products and good services and it's just a really obvious you know if we double that we will double that um impact i was just asked to touch on some of the legislation that's happening at the moment which obviously joe's really well versed in and we'll go on to talk about but uh, like joe said it's it's been disappointing from the perspective of, of governments really and um, that the last you know primary major review of cochran legislative uh, legislation was actually 1893 uh, we've got some considerable movement in the last um, you know, few years. The, the Financial Services and Markets Bill will allow credit unions to offer new products and services. That becomes really key. Again, something we can talk about, but that social impact, you know, that payday loan stuff that goes on, you know, you don't need to do that. You need to enable credit loop unions in your local areas to help fund, fund people when they're short of cash, for example. Um, and then we've got the Cooperative Mutuals and Friendly Societies Bill, which obviously the Cop Party has been strongly, uh, heavily involved in, in driving going forward. And that asset lock, you know, there's the whole conversation that's going on at the moment about John Lewis. We saw what happens to LV. And it's just a real lack of understanding that point that I said about extractive wealth and how it's really important to keep those co-op and mutual and credit unions in our localities. And there is talk of a law commission review eventually at last, because one of the issues that our members certainly have is around raising finance and capital. And we've got, um, you know, uh, we obviously we, we're very much looking forward to, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, general election for all the reasons you can imagine. Um, but we have actually got officers now in, in the likes of Treasurer who are really quite keen on helping unlock this. So it feels a very positive time to be in this sector and trying to unlock that that spend. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm being pretty much at five minutes, so I'm not going to go on about all the things that we do at, at Cooperatives UK. Um, I will send these slides on, but I just wanted to make you aware of what we're doing um, to grow that co-op economy. So we're putting together a lot of business support for co-ops. Today we announced another 400,000 from the Cooperative Bank to um, offer business support to startup co-ops and for existing cooperatives uh, to grow. Um, we're working um, on something called the Co-op Hackathon on the 11th and 12th of May, uh, because we believe, let's say, that if you actually build out a tech and digital infrastructure for the co-op movement that we all join together and work on, we could harness the power of uh, cooperatives. Again, I'll send these slides on so you can look at that in more detail. We're working in specific areas on something called the Ownership Hub, um, which is uh, the idea of in, in South Yorkshire and now Greater London, uh, working with the mayors actually to be able to deliver uh, you know, awareness and training. You know, I'm sure you're all aware that in education circles that co-op model isn't shared and talked about, so there's really low visibility. We have something called community shares where people, if you're looking to take over your local football club or your local pub, uh, we have ways that we can help you raise the finance and match that funding for you. So we're doing lots of uh, development around this area. Uh, happy to uh, talk further about it uh, as we go on. But as Joe said, the need is, is critical and we all benefit and we really do need to, you know, double the size of the cooperative con economy for everybody's benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. That's um, really useful and really informative. And I'm sure we've, everyone's got lots of questions to ask you, um, you know, particularly on that raising capital element. I think that people would be really interested to hear a bit more about that. Um, and then um, on to Glenn. Glenn, uh, please introduce Great. yourself. And um, we're looking to hear more about what Qantas is doing. Uh, thanks, Izzy, and hi everyone. Hope everyone's doing well wherever you are this evening. So my name is Glenn Bowen. I'm the interim director of uh, Compass. Our new chief exec will be joining us at the start of May. Um, a brilliant woman called uh, Bethan, uh, our first chief exec, um, uh, who's a woman and a Welsh speaker. So we will have a new chief exec replacing Derek Walker. Uh, most of you will know Derek, and Derek has gone on to be our future generations commission commissioner in Wales, which is um, a, a brilliant role um, for Derek and fits the values of Compass. 
Compass have been around for 40 years. Uh, we had our birthday last year and we've helped to set up, you know, hundreds and hundreds of co-op social enterprises and employee owned businesses in Wales. We're very much a cooperative development agency, although we changed our name last year to reflect everything that we do. And there was, a, you know, we had a good debate around um, the change uh, on our 40th anniversary year. So obviously we want to see uh, the co-op economy grow across the whole of the UK, but particularly in Wales. Just thinking, listening to Joe and Rose in terms of, you know, what do we need to do to grow that? And I just think, well, there's there's three things, isn't there? There's the the environment, the um, the ecosystem and legislative change that we need. Um, and there's resources and there's education, just as three broad brushes, if you think about that. And in Wales, I know we are really lucky in terms of the connectivity we've got to our elected officials. We've got so many co-op party members in all um, aspects of government within the Senate, within Cardiff Bay, which is brilliant. And it's not only, um, it's not until I come across the bridge and speak to colleagues from England that I, I realise how lucky we are um, and we, we can't take that for granted. So in terms of creating the ecosystem, we've definitely got buy-in to ministers, um, cabinet members and um, elected members in Senate. We can influence legislative change. An example of that is the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act, one of the first pieces of legislation that was put on statute from Cardiff Bay. We were there promoting the idea of cooperation and we had section 16 put in there, which put a duty on local authorities to talk to their communities and to talk to co-ops and social enterprises when they design and deliver social services. So that's an example of how we can get legislative change to create an enabling environment. Um, and we need more of that. We need more um, proactive legislation that actually puts a duty on people to think about doing things differently. In terms of resources, um, we're lucky in Wales. Um, we've, we've got um, uh, politicians who understand the need for support. So there's Business Wales um, that is there to provide business support to mainstream businesses and Welsh Government Fund Social Business Wales to provide support for co-op social enterprises and employee-owned businesses. And we at Compass deliver that along with other consortia uh, members within the ecosystem. Um, so so there's, there's a commitment there from Welsh Government that the resource is needed. We never have enough resources, so we have to be honest and realistic when we negotiate with government. Um, so it would always be nice to have more, but we're grateful that structural funds will come to an end in Wales at the end of June and Welsh Government are still funding uh, business support to um, the social business sector in Wales, which is really good. In terms of education, there's so much more to do in terms of, of schools and universities um, and, and colleges in terms of we've done loads of hackathons and we've done loads of entrepreneurship work within the university sector. And things are once you go in and start talking, there's a real um, sort of a thirst for more information around it. So we need to do more of that. And again, we've got a minister within Wales in charge of education that's really keen on co-ops. And I know we're going to be doing some work this year to try and create tools for teachers on, on co-ops. So we have to do more on co-op education. Just in terms of stuff that we're doing in Wales, I think, and I think, I think I've spoken to Rose about this previously. I think if we want people who currently wouldn't look at co-ops to think about co-ops, we have to go to where they are we have to talk in the language that they are talking, because otherwise they'll say, well, I don't want to do a co-op. Why would I want to do a co-op? But if you start talking about social good, if you start talking about empowering people, if you, you, you people then come in and are interested. So I think, yes, we want to set up more co-ops. Um, and and we, you know, we, we always try and encourage people to, to look at the, the co-op model. But we talk about community shares. So within Wales, we've got Community Shares Wales funded by the National Lottery. Since 2020, we've set up, um, you know, 12 community benefit societies. And, you know, they, they've raised a huge amount of capital from community. So they, we, we're creating new co-operators who didn't necessarily come in to become a co-op, they came in to save their pub or to, to save some of their other resources, but they become mini co-op champions because they see the benefit of doing that. We break down other sectors as well. So in housing in Wales, we're really pushing in terms of cooperative housing. We've broadened that out to community, let community led housing, because if you're turned off potentially by co-ops, well, let's talk to you. And what you find is we're working with a number of different groups that are actually we've got four groups that are shovel ready to, to build houses. 
you know, they're, so they're not all going to be housing co-ops. Some of them will be community land trusts, but they will all be social models. Um, and I know as purist co-operators, and I'm one of those, you know, we want everyone um, to sign up and be full co-ops. That's the ultimate aim. But I think sometimes we've got to go to where people are to talk to them and we've got to train them and educate them um, in, to become real co-op champions. I think the the last thing I suppose learning from Wales um, is where we can get political buy-in and um, support from elected members and I think we do get that and we can get them to sort of program bend resource. The other thing that we've come across and, and this is and I can give an example in housing is where the systems don't work so even where you've got buy-in from elected officials um, and there's a real will behind that that if the systems behind don't work then you're not going to get there and I give an example on on housing is you know we're talking to lots of communities now and how do we how do we get the capital to build these houses and we're talking to Welsh government about things like revolving loan funds and we're talking you know about community shares and we're talking to other sort of philanthropic investors um, but the problem you've got is the the systems of how we currently fund social housing within Wales that are well established and probably the same in England don't necessarily fit for the model for co-ops. So even though you get legislative change and you get buy-in from um, elected officials and politicians, once you get through there, the systems behind sometimes are not enabling as well. So I think that's a, just a, a quick thing that we found. You automatically assume once you get political buy-in and everybody's on board that things are going to happen. But the actual, the um, the sort of the hard wiring behind sometimes needs to change as well. But at least if you have got that political buy-in, it, it gives you power to your elbow to, to push, really. So just a, a whistle-stop tour in terms of the, the type of things we're doing in Wales. So yes, we're doing community shares. Yes, we're doing um, cooperative and community-led housing. Yes, we're trying to promote um, uh, cooperative care. We've got two pilot projects, one in a rural community in Newport Pems, working with a community, and one in an inner city area of Cardiff. And, you know, we, we're not being prescriptive, but we've got co-op development workers working with those communities to, to help them highlight what their care solutions um, are and to link in with that social services and Wales Be Wellbeing Wales Act and we are lucky that we have um, some support in the form of Social Business Wales. The other thing I will say from a co-op development perspective having funded business support is great but it's a very reactive service. Somebody come in and say, can you help me set up this business? And we say, yes. Or can you help me grow this business? And we'll say, yes. It's not the traditional co-op development model where you create something from nothing when people don't even know that model's there. So when I started 27 years ago, I was out two or three evenings a week having public meetings, go, you know, and really doing that co-op development. So even though we say we've got resource, which is brilliant, and we are setting up, you know, social enterprises and co-ops, um, we, we still don't do that traditional community development, um, sorry, co-op development across the piece, other than in things like community shares and if we're looking at sector specific stuff as well. And the last one big thing for us is employee ownership, again, going to where people are. We have managed to get into the Labour Party manifesto for the Senate elections that we would double the size of the employee owned sector within Wales. And that's getting a lot of traction for us now in terms of where there is political will and political support. When we said we we started the uh, assembly term with 30 employee owned businesses, we wanted to get to 60 by 2026, and we're already at 54, you know, and which is brilliant because again, the, the more people who hear about this, a no brainer for those those business owners who care about their employees, who care about their communities, who want to make sure that there's a legacy for when they leave that business, and especially in Wales where we've got real, you know, rural communities that if that business was sold, it would be ripped out to that community so yeah i suppose that's the key message for me is legislative changes the investment the education to grow it but also when we talk and educating let's go to where people are as opposed to expect people to come to us and, and to, to listen to us and yeah beware of those structural things the hard wiring behind the legislation as well that we'll need to overcome so uh, yeah back to you back to you izzy thanks um, well, thank you for that, Glenn. I, I think that's really, really highlighted all, all the key, key things that we need to focus on, um, all of us, I think, on, on the call tonight, um, not just uh, um, you, Rose and Joe. Um, but let's, um, um, 
let's go uh, let's go to some questions now um so um if anyone wants to put their hands up um um we've got a couple in the chat um um i think uh phil um has um said what progress can we uh make on care co-ops such as Col valley um so um, maybe we could answer that uh, session. Um, um, Rose did mention that you've got a session on uh, Congress on that. So that will be very interesting as well, because that's a really good area uh, that we focused on um, in our uh, policy last year, um, the co-op policy. Um, so um, there's a question that um, Breck has got her hands up. So I'm going to ask, um, would you like to speak, Breck? Or I'll just send you a uh, message to unmute. No, that doesn't seem to be working. Um, no, I think I have managed to. Uh, can, uh, can I be heard now? Yes, we can hear you now. Now, can I be very positive and say this is all too general? I want a recipe on how to do something or another. Now, I have dutifully listened in to these uh, after evening sessions, and uh, I just feel I need a recipe how to start a hairdressers cooperative. Um, you know, it, it may sound, I know that um, Blaise Lambert has got an amazing recipe on how to start housing cooperatives. And I think we need something. I think you're breaking up there, Brett, but I think we've, we've, got, we've got the gist of what you're saying. Um, I think that's something probably Rose, you can... Um, it's all a little bit at a low to know how can I do it? End of topic. Um, I think, Rose, over to you on that one. Yeah, um, hi, Breck. Um, yeah, we, I was just pulling, I was, I'll put it in the chat. We've got various how to start guides on our um, uh, website. But I think the truth is, um, you know, you can produce the guides all day long. Um, what you know, my observation about about uh, cooperation um, is that you can't it can't be top down kind of forced onto people as in and, and that includes even how you do it and how you say up. I've never come across even in something like housing. I've never come across two co-ops that have got the same constitutions, the same ideas, the same plans. And there's, there's an element of um it, you know joining things like co-op connections groups and and talking peer to peer so yeah we've got those guides there i can send them across like i say blaze has got an amazing actually wayfinder i don't know if you've seen the wayfinding product i think the opportunity about that product that blaze has developed for housing would be an ideal way to go forward uh, for anybody that's not not seen it and um, it's a whole bunch of cards that allows you to work through things like do we own the property? Are we renting it? Is it freehold? Is it leasehold? Do we want this type of person, that type of person? And you kind of come away building out your constitution. So I actually think um, I think that the guides are, are there, actually, but it's more about um, the ambition of, of the people to, to want to. And that's what we're seeing in things like the ownership hub and the work that we're doing um, with the mayors is about raising awareness for people to even know that they can they can even operate a business like that so yeah i'll put it in the chat um but yeah i do uh, i think it's it's more complex than just necessarily providing a how-to guide there is thank you and glenn you were nodding now i saw that so um yeah i, I suppose the other thing i always say when i you know when i was back in the game of setting up um co-ops is is the, I also put the glue. So in terms of you can't say, well, I, I want to set up a co-op because it's the other people that are coming together and what is the glue that binds you as a potential co-op? And that glue has got to be strong enough. There's got to be benefits for everybody because actually if there's no benefit for, for you know, to a free, then it's just not going to, um, it's not going to work really. So uh, yeah, you need the glue to bind the, uh, the cooperators when, they, when they're going through the difficult setting up. Thank you. And I can see a couple more hands up now. So um, we've got Saxon and Dennis who want to speak. So if I, if I un, uh, send, we'll go to Saxon first and then on to Dennis after that. So, 
like so you should be able to unmute. Is that better? Yep, no, we can hear you now, Saxon. Yeah. Um, particularly directing this to our secretary. Um, he's talked about the importance of the general election, but on the 4th of May, we've got a um, huge number of local elections and an opportunity, for instance, I'm from Devon, we hope Plymouth will once more be a, a Labour Cooperative Council. In Exeter, where we are in power, we have six of our 13 candidates for Labour Cooperative. And local authorities are particularly concerned with bringing services in-house. And we do have some examples. Devon's library service is a mutual which has not closed any libraries. And the youth service, what's left of it, is mutual. Are we going to be ready on the 5th of May to be providing um, templates for councils who want to bring their services back in house? Um, and I share the concerns of people about the care sector where it does seem there's a crying need for uh, cooperative mutuals. Thanks, Sex Saxon. And um, Dennis, would you like to? Ask your question. Well, I, I put my questions in the uh, the chat, but I thought uh, it'd be worth mentioning them. <clears throat> there are the two areas that I think that we need to look at. One is one which would allow small businesses in the local area uh, to keep their personal autonomy in their business, but come together and have a co-op to provide services, legal services, financial services, but also personnel and recruitment services. And um, one example uh, is that small businesses have a great difficulty in taking kids from school, for example, or people who are wanting to return to the labor force because they're not big enough to carry that themselves. Uh, but if they had a group of them, they could say, you know, together we'll take say 10 people and we'll share them between us uh, and, and provide them with some kind of support. Uh, the, the advantage of this is that if one person doesn't fit, they can move to somewhere else. So it takes some of the burden of this away from small businesses. And my other broader suggestion is that we should look at how the informal sector operates. Uh, you know, we mentioned already uh, credit unions replacing uh, payday loans, but you know, for some reason or other, some people still prefer payday loans. And I think that's partly to do with the bureaucracy. And so we need to look at ways of uh, mitigating that impact. So. Uh, Final point would be on the care cooperatives. Uh, there's, <clears throat> there's been some questions about rural and seaside uh, development recently. And I've mentioned there that what we really need in rural areas, I used to live in West Derbyshire, I now live in Redcar by the seaside. What we really need in rural areas is a kind of cooperative that offers social care, housing and dedicated transport so that people who are in social care can, uh, spend time away from the social care and perhaps meet families and friends elsewhere. So I think there needs coordination there, not just doing individual co-ops. Thank you. Good stuff. I'll uh, take a couple of those, Izzy. Um, so that's uh, at least uh, get started on it. So thanks very much. Uh, Saxon, uh, just in terms of local government, absolutely right. Um, the co-op party is doing remarkable work uh, uh, in local government, not just in terms of our level of representation, but what we're then doing in uh, in town halls, whether in opposition or in, in power. And you're right to say you've got some fantastic numbers of candidates in the southwest. Uh, colleagues on the call will know that we're standing a record number of candidates once again in local these local elections. So we're up at 1,100 uh, candidates Corp candidates uh, up for election in in on the fourth of May. Uh, that's uh, our third year on the run of having a thousand candidates, uh, and we are a we've doubled uh, the number. Uh, double is one of the phrases for today, uh, but doubled the number of corp candidates from when these exact seats were fought four years ago. So four years ago uh, we were at five hundred and forty-five. Uh, today uh, eleven hundred. So we have exponential growth uh, in in local government, which is great. And then you, you write about, well, that's all very well and good, uh, but what are you going to do when you're in? 
Um, and I think that's the next part. I, and it's been the bit, bit we've been focused on uh, with our existing candidates. So if you look at some of the work of uh, the Court Party in, in, in local government, um, we've got some great stuff. I mean, if you look at the diverse councils uh, motion that we've uh, got, we've got our food justice, we've got our modern slavery, we've got our uh, pieces on fair tax. We've got tens of councils uh, and hundreds of councils and some of them come on each piece of the Court Party journey in that space. But what I want is I want them to now get involved in cooperative development. I absolutely want that. And if you look at some of the councils that we've got, some of the great uh, corp leaders uh, we have, and you've mentioned one actually, Saxon, there in Plymouth. I, I listened and I obviously worked with Plymouth for a long time um, uh, myself. And I was at the Southwest Conference like you, uh, Saxon, and Tudor's story there about where, what he's been able to do and how he's been able to grow uh, the corp uh, uh, sector and movement in Plymouth is, is a fantastic story. It's a testament. Everyone should be listening. Uh, but then there's others. Uh, someone like uh, Phil Glanville in Hackney. Uh, look at what Phil's done. He's just launched his new fund for a specific fund for growth. He's got a little unit going. It's fantastic. People in Greenwich got uh, their own cooperative development unit. Uh, it's a bit, uh, still going, still doing uh, fantastic work. And uh, so there are outcrops of where councils really are seasoned into cooperative development. And I, I want that to be much, much more. And it's a big focus for me uh, post-election because, and you did mention the next bit, which was, oh, well, you know, talk about the general election. But the next piece of that double the size and the piece of detail I didn't go into is I see one of the key deliveries, uh, delivery agents of this uh, change to be in local and regional government. I want those ownership hubs, uh, which Rose uh, mentioned in, in her presentation, I want them to be bigger. Uh, I want them to be on permanent footing and I want them to be right across the country. I don't just want them to be in South Yorkshire or, or London. I don't want them to be on a two year programme. I want them to be permanent. I want them to be properly staffed and I want them to be developing co-ops and I want them to have a fantastic reach back into Whitehall as well. So not only are we growing in and we're now represented on 80 percent of all councils, we've got 90 percent of all councils uh, having elections have got co-op candidates now. Not only are we now at one, uh, nearly 25 percent, uh, 20 percent of all Labour uh, elected representatives of Labour co-op. But I want them to be the delivery agents right on the front line when we get, we're able to put together those pieces both nationally and locally. So you're absolutely right. I do see it as a, as, as a critical piece of the jigsaw. It is something we're properly focused on. Um, in terms of uh, Dennis, Dennis, uh, have a look. Uh, we launched a rural affairs um, uh, review uh, this week, I think. Uh, I was in uh, for maybe Monday. Have a look. There's some fantastic pieces of coordinated joined up rural affairs uh, policy within that uh, within that review all up on the website i think some of the uh, some of the partners involved in putting that together uh, are, are are hugely knowledgeable hugely fantastic uh, cooperators and it's well worth a look i hope it's going to be taken on by our party chair, uh, Shadow Secretary of State for Rural Affairs, Jim, Jim McMahon. So I'm hoping to see some fantastic pieces out coming out of that as well, Dennis. So worth a look there. And just on your small business point, uh, Dennis, and I'm not going to touch on all of the uh, uh, the wide point you made in the small business, um, because it, others may want to touch on secondary co-ops and other things, which it sort of was taking us towards. Um, but for myself, I'll tell you what I really want. Uh, mutual guarantee societies for some small business, like so in terms of access to finance for smes um a, a remarkable number of european small business small and medium-sized businesses are part of mutual guarantee societies co-ops uh, it's only our country really you decide oh no we can't have mutual guarantee societies because of surety ship and then wonder why we struggle with small and medium-sized business uh, investment so i want to see that uh, the, the other pieces in terms of business support and other secondary co-op uh, type activity would, I'm sure, would be hugely uh, welcome and, and useful. But in a really practical point, I want mutual guarantee societies. If you haven't had a look at them, have a look at them. Uh, they're all over the world. They're all over Europe, uh, apart from this little island who decided that we know better uh, and we really shouldn't have. So, yeah, hopefully that helps in terms of some of the some of the points. But others may want to come in on some of the other wider points you made as well, uh, Dennis. Thanks, Joe. Um, Glenn, over to you. Yeah, just quickly, because I can see Vivian's got his hand up as well, in terms of the, yeah, the, the sort of secondary co-ops or consortia. Again, we did a lot of work, you know, back 20 odd years ago with different sectors in the farming sector in Wales, because they had a good example of cooperation where they, they come together 
with things like machinery rings, so they'd, they'd buy all the hardware and as a co-op and run as, as machinery ring. Um, I think the, the the one lesson is when they get big, they almost forget that they co-opt as well. So there, there is a little bit of other things when we when you get to scale like that. The challenge, I think, of 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 setting the setting them up on a small scale where you've got sort of 10, you know, 15, 20 businesses, is they're all really bit busy business people. So trying to get them around the table to set something up and get it to the point where it can pay for itself is a challenge. And it's almost when we were doing the farming co-ops, we said to Welsh Government, almost you need an element of upfront funding to, to fund some of our work because everybody's so busy. And then if somebody takes charge of trying to do more of the work for the consortia, they're not doing their own work and then they get a bit a bit angry because somebody else isn't doing their work. So that is the challenge, is how do you get to the point of using the um, essentially the volunteers from the member businesses to get it to a point where they can charge their fees, employ their staff, and then the executive team can actually make the, um, the co-op play. So just an observation on on one of the challenges of that sort of consortium, that small micro consortium model, really. Thanks, Izzy. Problem. And Rose, have you got anything to add? Uh, yeah, just the, the addition around, um, I think that the reason I think care co-ops is, is particularly uh, prevalent um, is because of the origins of, of cooperation around being in broken markets and when things aren't fair. Um, and I do think, let's say that's why we're doing a session on Congress, I do think we need to really focus on this as a, a sector outside of growing the movement, you know, in terms of all that development. It, it just feels like if you could have parity of voice between the beneficiaries who are accessing the care um, the actual commissioners of the care, but the workers as well. It's just, you know, wh why are we treating the workers of your most loved possessions, normally people that you want to care for, um, with such low wages and such terrible working conditions. So wholly agree with you. And I think we've got to directly intervene um, in, in this space. I'm really pleased to see that Co-op Party are on, on the same mission as well. Thanks. And just um, on Saxon's point about what, what do we want to tell our councillors that are being elected in May, uh, we are holding a local government conference in June where we're going to spotlight the work, some of our really good work of some of our other elected cooperators um, um, to get them to share back best practice how they've how they've got those commitments but they put in their manifestos and how they're delivering them um, across the UK so do encourage any new and old councillors who have to come along and I can see Vivian's got his hand up so I'm going to pass over to him for uh, probably a final question so um, Thanks, William. Yes, thank, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all the really great contributions we've had this evening. I've really enjoyed it. And I just want to pick up on the point about secondary co-ops, um, uh, because Glenn mentioned, you know, the important, the, the difficulty that sometimes you get when a co-op gets larger. And, and I think, uh, by the way, I don't think that all large co-ops lose their co-opness, but uh, it is a risk and uh, and it's something that they need to be aware of. But one of the great things about secondary co-ops is that they can help small co-ops continue to function without necessarily having to scale themselves and i think it's a, a striking statistic that in germany the secondary co-op known as uh, the dz bank which is the secondary co-op for uh cooperative banks supports a thousand local and regional cooperative banks to operate and they would not be able to operate without that uh, because it provides all the back office services and the, the it and so on that enables them to operate and between them, they have 17% of the market. That's what a secondary co-op can achieve. And, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, I mean, I'm involved in the secondary co-op student cooperative homes because we have the same vision to help sec uh, small student housing co-ops. I can see my fellow board member, Martin Meatyard, on the, on the screen here. Um, we've both got the same vision that this is, enables small student housing co-ops to operate where they wouldn't be able to uh, get the capital together to acquire a property or to to manage it and um you know if you think about um in india how hundreds of farming co-ops have come together to form ifco which is uh, an amazing farmers co you know they it manufactures and distributes fertilizers to really i think it's even thousands of farming co-ops around india and there between them the number of member farmers that they represent is 55 million and that has uh, been achieved since the 1960s 
Um, so I think we need to be bold. I think we need to be to say to government, uh, to the next Labour government, please think strategically. Think about how you develop industries. You know, you don't think just in terms of lots of individual little startups. You think about creating the infrastructure that enables uh, uh, clusters within industries to thrive, where you get that network effect and a secondary co-op can really deliver that. Um, and so I, I think we should make it a core part of our ask um, and, and we should identify the sectors where um, secondary co-ops can make a really big difference as well. Um, I mean, we shouldn't forget that the CWS was perhaps the first secondary co-op and it was the driver, the engine that enabled consumer cooperation to grow in this country. Uh, and the same model exists in many countries around the world. So it's not new. Uh, uh, it's actually very tried and tested. I think what I, uh, I've, in terms of uh, responding, uh, having a goal there, Vivian, um, is about that sort of setting the, the, the circumstance, I think is a really important aspect of it. Um, the, in that, it's somewhere, I, I read somewhere in around sort of, I think it was South Korea, uh, South Korea uh, doubled the size of their cooperative sector in 2012 in two years, because they set their, yes, yes, uh, because they set, the, they set the environment and they said that, that they did want to grow. So there is that a, a government's ability to think strategically and deliver the sort of growth that we're looking for has, has existed around the world. Um, I also think uh, uh, in terms of, and I haven't really talked about sectors this evening from my own point of view, because I would have some views about which sectors I think uh, are more ripe for cooperation than, than others, perhaps. Um, but I've, I've tried to centre it on basic ambition and basic uh, tools of growth rather than getting towards individual sectors, individual uh, regulatory environments. Um, but one thing I do think uh, in terms of um, the, uh, the your, your point about secondary co-ops is about the co-op movement's responsibility themselves uh, and ourselves like to, provide, to, to, to help with growth as well. Um, because I think that it, it's not all about that uh, and, support and, and political support. I do think that there is need for uh, the, the movement itself to think strategically about how it, it seeks to grow. Um, I think that sometimes secondary co-op uh, activity, especially ones of other co uh, cooperative, in, uh, existing cooperative endeavour, is one best done by the corps of movement. So I, I don't think we should be, and I was something I was saying at retail conference, I think responsibility goes both ways. Um, so I th I'm definitely up for further discussion about what government can do in secondary corps. But I also think maybe it's a question back to the wider movement about where do you think uh, secondary corps, where you can provide uh, secondary corps of support uh, would, be, would be well placed as well. Um, so just a re an initial reflection uh, on, on the on the contribution, Vivian. Can I come back quickly? Yeah. Yeah, just to say, I mean, Glenn was talking about the, I mean, I agree with you, it's got to come from the movement. Glenn was talking about the difficulty that you sometimes get if you've got a cluster of businesses that could benefit from a secondary call, that they don't have the bandwidth to yeah. uh, to set it up. And that's where you can, you know, I think we could be saying to, to government, Look, this is an established sector. This is an established sector of businesses. They, this is where we can help them gain scale and gain depth and breadth in their activities um, by adding something that they are struggling to do themselves. And, you know, a little bit of government funding to actually establish that secondary co-op and provide the, the pump priming for it can make a huge difference and have a huge multiplier effect to that sector. So that's that's kind of where I think we could we could go in. Yeah, no, I, I see that point, and it, it's a really important one. Um, I think once you get towards different types of sector and in that sort of piece, it really does lend itself into it, especially uh, Glenn's example was a fantastic one in rural affairs and something uh, we're looking at uh, again in rural affairs, but outside of Wales. Um, I think it's a really important point when, once you start into those bits about what type of uh, area you think is ripe for growth as well. So, no, I, I take the point, Vivian. And Rose, Glenn, do you want to add anything? Um, from, from my perspective, um, there's some really exciting um, opportunities um, in, in the secondary uh, co-op space, um, and particularly around uh, multi-stakeholder or even where, um, uh, Joe touched on it earlier, you know, different forms of business that are not necessarily 
co-ops, but, uh, you know, kind of have got a social purpose coming together. And I think this point about how government could enable it, I think it's a really strong one, uh, Vivian, in respect of, um, you know, we, we, we set people up to compete. So whether that's um, procurement at a local level, for example, you know, we don't kind of, uh, you know, as, as a society, we don't kind of put structures in place to allow people to cooperate. You have these, you know, organisations like charity, social enterprise cooperatives working in a sector, um, all doing amazing work, but actually they were incentivized through procurement to kind of, you know, bring, come together as a co-op to, you know, work together on their strengths and weaknesses, but it's just not within the, the, the thinking at all of our, of our government. So yeah, I completely agree. I think it'd be great to see that. And again, um, well, actually Mid Counties is involved in a really exciting co-op, the secondary co-op in, in, in my opinion, which is around um, modern slavery. And again, it's some of the members of that co-op are, you know, actually traditional forms of business, but they've been brought together in cooperation. So I think there's two sides to it. One is about growing the sector and having those really pure secondary co-ops that are bringing together smaller co-ops, et cetera. But I don't think we should shy away from the idea that getting cooperation generally into public um, sector commissioning, into government and, and local council thinking, and just into the thought processes of, of businesses themselves the idea of cooperation shouldn't be um something that people shy away from and it, it currently is it's all about competition and glenn have you got some final thoughts that we can round off with um our, our discussion tonight because i see we're rapidly run out of time it's amazing how quickly an hour goes Thank you. yeah just a, a quick one picking up joe's point on we can have, have an ask of government but we should also have an ask of us as a sector and I think, you know, we, we still have a lot of almost ninja co-ops out there that just are under the radar doing really good work with the business on a day to day basis, but are quite happy not to talk about being a co-op. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a question as why. And actually, there's, you know, in terms of we, we've got to continually train and educate and do the governance piece within our co-ops uh, and in terms of our values and principles. So I think I think there is a key ask for us as well. If we're asking government to do stuff in the future, what is the ask for us as a sector? And we've got to shout about being a co-ops more and, and, uh, and be, be promoting the sector ourselves. Thank you. I think that's a really good point to finish with. Um, and I just want to say thank you very much for everyone to, for joining us today. Uh, thank you for joining us on Zoom. Thank you to our speakers, Rose, Ben, Joe, and uh, all those really good questions as well. Um, and um, I'm just want to plug we've we've got another um corporation live zoom on our uh, to looking at our rural review report uh which was la launch launched earlier this week that's next wednesday so if you're interested and want to hear more about that please come along and join us again then um and just on that note i just want to say thanks very much again and um good night everyone thank you thank you bye bye, -bye. thanks all bye, -bye.